start from what we uh, observed yesterday in your FYP uh, presentation. Uh, really, you are doing a good job. And uh, uh, in regard to your uh, situation as undergraduate uh, students, it's very, very good uh, uh, from you, uh, all the efforts you have done and all the thought you, you experience. I have uh, only one, uh, one point I want to, to draw your, your attention. It's, it's part of our course also. Do not uh, trust computer software blindly. This is very important. Uh, you, you measure your data, you observe your data, you get your data and put in the computer. Okay? And then the computer, according to some parameters, produce some image for you. It's your responsibility to see and criticize the images you, you obtain from the computer. It's not holy book or holy uh, thing that we, we, we take from the, uh, the computer and then, okay, this is, uh, no. We, as a geophysicist, working in the earth. So there is some relations, some features that must be weighed and must be taken into consideration. So I have to uh, ask myself, the image I got is geologically acceptable? Is this natural or not natural? And then, if I discover this is not logic, I, I go for solution, reviewing my work from start, reviewing the parameters I introduced into the software, and then start over again till I get something meaningful from the geological point of view. But you are doing very well and excellent, and thank you. Today, we are going to continue our discussion. We start last, uh, yesterday about Kirchhoff or Kirchhoff migration. Uh, I choose to, to return about two or three uh, slides back uh, to start from today. Uh, we discussed today 2D uh, Kirchhoff migration. And I, I hope you understand the uh, concept and the application. And we moved from 2D application, from 2D seismic application, we used throughout the course till this week. And now we're starting to enter 3D seismic method, or seismic imaging. As, of course, we are working on imaging the subsurface structure. So, yesterday we were speaking about why 3D is more realistic than 2D. Because the universe, the globe, is 3D, it's not 2D. The subsurface is 3D, it's not 2D. Which means the parameters, the properties, change not only in one dimension or two dimension, but also in three dimensions. But I can say also parameters at some times change in four dimensions. Can anybody tell me what is the fourth dimension here? Time. Excellent. The fourth dimension is time. So, when you go further and become more uh, experienced, you realize that we have also 40 seismic uh, analysis 
and this is uh, uh, applied after the uh, exploitation in the, in the period of uh, exploiting the oil and the gas from the subsurface to observe the change in velocity and to observe the change in uh, other uh, physical properties, especially the elastic uh, properties of the rocks, to monitor the rate of exploitation because when you are uh, exploiting oil and gas from the subsurface, you are disturbing the balance, you are disturbing the equilibrium, and then there is a, a risk of uh, damaging of the uh, of the boreholes or of the production producing wells. So monitoring in 4D, we can manage. We can say stop now uh, or inject some. Uh, fluids into the subsurface to retain the balance of the subsurface. Now, return for the 3D, because the 3D changes its properties in three dimensions. So, in profiling, we do have reflection energy and maybe also refraction energy coming off the plane of the profile. And since it's coming off the plane of the profile, I cannot put this point or this energy in its proper location. Which is uh, described in the second point, which is in 2D we may get the reflections and diffractions from points outside the plane. Thus, all our migration will fail or become somehow misleading. Misleading means we may have reflectors and the seismic cross section, but this reflector is not present. It's artificial. It's due to the computer. So, returning back, computer, computers or PCs cannot think. It obeys what you say. It obeys what you feed. So, if you feed the computer something good, it will produce something good for you. So, if you carelessly in input uh, some bad data, it will produce some bad models for you. So, take care. This also is an example of the situation we have for 2D and 3D efforts for seismic. As you see, we have energy in the 3D section that is not present here in the 2D. Why? Because we have data coming from other planes, uh, anti-plane or off-plane, and this data is now reduced to its proper location in 3D. However, in 2D we cannot do the same. Also the amplitude and you see the amplitude of the shallower reflectors, the energy is higher than the amplitude here at the, the same reflector at the 2D size. So working in 3D is more realistic, working in 3D is more accurate and so more working on 3D is now the target of oil and gas companies. However, the data, the model space increase as we are now working on 3D cube with huge number of samples. So it's very uh, cost expensive and we need uh, some sort of uh, hypothesis, some sort of routines to reduce such effort or to reduce such computational cost. And speaking about 3D migration, we're also uh, working with my Kirchhoff migration. For the 3D zero offset migration, we have three points or three steps. The first one is to extract or simulate by stacking the zero, zero offset data set.
Can anybody tell me now what is the zero offset data set? What is the zero offset data set? No. Okay, that's good. The shot point and the geophone at the same location. So we call zero offset. The offset is the distance between the shot and the geophone. Okay? So please, I want you to review your, your lecture because we speak. We have a lot of discussion about zero offsets before. So we extract or simulate by stacking the zero offset data set, which is P at x, y, z equal zero and t. And then consider this to be measured in half wave, half velocity medium, medium with exploding reflectors. So, if you remember what we mean by exploding reflector, we choose to put the source or to put the shot at the reflector, not at the surface. And we assume that the velocity is half the velocity, so that mapping, mapping or uh, downward continuation of the seismic uh, data till the time equal time t equal zero will put or image the source or the position of the source at the reflector. And uh, we, we discussed earlier that we can explode, which means it's not exploding the, 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 the reflector itself, but to put all the shot points at the reflector. So if we define the locations of the shot, points at the reflector, we are defining the reflector itself. Step two, we do a downward continuation, which means inverse extrapolation from the surface level to a level in the subsurface according to the relation. Uh, we have minus one, minus one divided by two by partial, this partial Z means we are differentiating according to the vertical, according to the depth axis. Integration over from uh, X uh, superscript S and Y superscript S, which the, means the locations of the uh, geophones. Uh, for uh, P, which is a collected data set, of x, s, y, s, z, s equal zero. Here equal zero means we are here at the surface. And t plus two r over c. Divided by r, and here we have the integration in terms of d, x, s, and d, y, s. Okay? Then we select at each depth level the zero time component this zero time component, as we, we have uh, I, I, an idea before, this zero time component represents the location of the show of the shot, of the location of the source at the reflector, which is defined here by the relation B migration equal X, uh, B migration of X, Y, and Z. Here we, we are speaking about the subsurface, equal P, which is a data set at X, Y, Z for time t equal zero. Okay? Now, for this, we end up with geologic section. We are not ending up with uh, time section. We are ending up, up here with geologic section. Here is how the downward extrapolation is, is done. We are uh, de de driving the relation in terms of the z direction. And these are the increment we are incrementing or are we measure, we are measuring the differentiation here.
The artifact here, that velocity is needed for applying 3D migration. The same case for 2D migration. Okay? So, in the present case, we need to know the velocity change in three dimensions, meaning in X, Y, and Z directions, which is not feasible. In addition, using a velocity which change especially will also complicate the problem. Generally speaking, our problem is, is uh, represented uh, through partial differential equation, which is called the wave equation. The wave equation cannot be solved analytically unless we use very simple assumption about the medium, homogeneity, isotropism, flat surface, and so on. We can find analytical solution for some complex uh, feature, but, but not so complex. Some say for, <clears throat> say we have fault or so, but this will take a lot of computation. We may take months to, to compute. So we are moving to numerical methods, like yesterday we speak about, we have an idea about the ray theory. It's one of the methods. Also, there is a finite difference, finite elements. All these are used for uh, solving the wave equation for complicated media. But when we are dealing with 3D media, we are dealing with more and more complication, which means that we may end up with cost uh, expensive uh, problem. So we need to uh, somehow at some time we need, we need to simplify the problem. Our final meeting with migration in this part, because we are going to meet migration again. We speak about migration. We have an idea about migration in the uh, post stack. We will have also another type of migration at the pre stack. So we, it, will, it is time migration using the stacking velocities. Now you understand we have two types of velocities. We, we, we have an idea about two types of velocities now. I'm not going to ask you what are these two types, but the first one is the root mean square velocity, and the second one is the average velocity. Okay? Now, in this, we are meeting the third one, which is called the interval velocity. Okay? The interval velocity, that velocity between uh, two interfaces, it represents the velocity within the layer itself. It's called interval velocity. So to overcome the problem of not knowing the interval velocity in your medium, people have thought of work around. All our science work is to work around. So we have an obstacle, we cannot cross this obstacle, we move around this our scale by some assumption. The work around here is to use stacking velocities. As we have done in a stack, uh, a stack in general, the stacking velocity are already known. At this point, we, we have done stacking, so we know the stacking velocity. So we are going here to use the stacking velocity. Uh, we need to know in this equation the distance uh, r from subsurface point to the to the surface, which depend on the velocities in the subsurface. So we know that we have the time to know the distance. We should have the velocity. Yes or no? Yes. Because velocity is distance divided by time. So if I want to know the distance, so I have to, and I have the time, so I have to get the velocity. 
Okay? It's often assumed that this path can be approximated by a straight line as an homogeneous medium using the stacking velocity. Therefore, R is replaced by here R divided by C, which is the time, equal T square, tau squared plus 4xs squared plus 4ys squared divided by C squared RMS all under the square root. Excuse me? Okay. Furthermore, the extrapolated data is considered in migrated time and not in depth. So now in time migration, we are not unlike the, the previous one. We are here working in time, not depth. Which transform equations 32 uh, uh, into? We have the previous equation for the migration. Uh, P, X, Y, here tau instead of Z, equal minus 1 divided by 2Y, and this is the relation for downward extrapolation. Again, which is describes a diffraction stack if we also neglect the derivative to depths. In this type of migration, it's assumed that the structure and the subsurface are simple, simple enough to use the hyperbolic approximation of the response of an exploding reflector source. So if the, the subsurface is not simple, we cannot use the radiation so far discussed. Now we have two examples, this one and the, the next one, showing the effect of wrong migration velocity on the record. The first one is the zero offset section. The second one represents the migration with correct uh, velocity. The third one, this one, we have two high migration velocity. We see we still have energy here. And also, the last one with too low migration velocity, and we see how it looks like. Sometimes they call this smiling, migration smiling, if we are using high, uh, too high velocity. In a realistic seismic cross-section, the first one is stacked and you, you realize the, the problem with uh, diffraction. We have here diffraction, we have here a uh, uh, bow tie uh, problem here at this one. The, the upper right one represents the desired migration, what we should have. Here we have medium velocity, which seems somehow uh, okay. Then moving to 5% five, five higher velocity, we, we start to have artificial features. And then 10% higher, the, the features increase. And then 20% higher, the smearing and uh, sorry, the uh, diffraction and some artificial reflectors begin to, uh, to be displayed. So migration is very important, but must be uh, done carefully. We have to take care. We have to take care when we are dealing with migration. Again, the software is so powerful, but it cannot think. If I can bring somebody who, whose work is only to get the data and put in the computer and then click some buttons, buttons and then get me the, re the, the record at the last without any comment, without any criticization. So why I, I choose to pay so much money to geophysicists? 
where I can get technician who can do the same without the same. I, I will. The, the, the oil industry is looking for uh, cost reduction, not to pay a lot of money. So your work is not only to to operate, but to think while you operate. Uh, now we are going to refresh ourselves somehow by uh, begin session of land and marine seismic acquisition. Today we are we're going to start with land seismic survey. As you see, this is an illustrated illustration of the acquisition. Here we have the source. Here it's uh, the uh, the hammer, and here is the geophones. And this point, the subsurface, is called the reflection of points. Each point of this is called common or called min, uh, midpoint, because in horizontal interface for reflection, the reflection point. It occurs in the, mid, in the middle or at the center between the shot and receiver. Then the data recorded goes to seismograph. So we have seismogram and we have seismograph and we have seismometer. Okay? You understand the difference between the seismogram, seismograph and seismometer? Okay, you understand? Okay. Seismogram is a display of recorded seismic data. So we call this seismogram. Seismograph is a, an instrument itself. It's an instrument for recording seismic data. Seismometer is a geophone. Geophone is a special case of a seismometer. It's the measuring or conversion of elastic vibration or mechanical vibration into electric signal. In our discussion today and, and tomorrow, we are going to review the sources of the shot types we are using in land seismic survey. We have, uh, we have sources that uh, good enough for, uh, for land and cannot work for marine. And also we have shots for marine that cannot operate in land. We have also geophones. In marine we call hydrophone. And now we are, and we are also we are, we are going to have a discussion about the geophone interval and arrays. So uh, how to choose the geophone intervals, the length of the array, and it's related to the depth of, of investigation, and also the resolution I'm looking for, where, which is here uh, the spread length, recording time, I'm how much time I need the instrument to record. That's very important to, to understand because it's related to the depth of investigation. If I'm going deeper, I'm, I'm expecting to record longer, longer time. Is it okay? Okay? For shallow? I will short, use shorter time. And also the sample rate. So we have sample rate, record time, recording time. These are not only a factor for the experiment and what I'm looking for, but also it's related to the seismograph itself. We have memory and we have number of channels. And this memory can be filled if I choose 
high sample rate and long time, longer recording time. So in all our work, we are looking for the optimum and to save as we can, you know. We can do many, many, many things with, with geophysics and with science. But we will, at, the, at this point, we are going to, to, to waste a lot of money. Our intention is to save, is to save money, it's not to spend money on something that we can, we, we, that will not benefit the, the, uh, the company, for example. Today we are going to have discussion about the sources we are using. So, as an introduction, we can say that many factors affect the choice of the proper source for given experiment. For example, in, in, in Amelie, last, last year, I guess, you, you, you used hammer. Some of you in, in FYB used uh, wet drop. And these sources are enough for the target, for the objective of the experiment. Okay, but some other projects is not fulfilled, is not, uh, this, this type of, of, of sources is not good, is not sufficient to obtain the objectives. So, one of these factors, one of these factors uh, is the maximum depth of investigation. So, if I am working on shallow depths, I do not need to have uh, sources that uh, operate for deeper depths. I can just use the weight drop. If I'm not, if I'm working or looking for deeper interfaces, deeper reflectors, like the present case in oil and gas, so I cannot use, for example, the hammer. It will be kidding. People will say, what, what, what are they doing? They're using hammer to, to go for uh, a kilometer or so depths, so they, they will fire us uh, directly. Uh, and in, in oil and gas industry, when you commit fatal mistake, it's not the problem of one company. It's your problem will be with most of the companies because the, the, the news will spread like, like fire in, in, in a dry jungle and nobody can, when you go to any company, you find yourself have bad reputation there. So take care. Uh, deeper exploration requires more energy, thus sometimes explosives might be used. Uh, actually, explosives or dynamites is the most uh, desired source. So why? Because it's impulsive. It gives us impulsive wavelet, so we are uh, hopefully, we are always hoping to use uh, dynamite. In shadow surveying, a hammer or wet drop may be sufficient to be used. The seismic sources should also have narrow wavelet. Why have narrow wavelet to increase resolution? If I am, if I am having thin bed, so when the uh, when I if if I my my source produce a spike or a delta function then the, the thin bed will be visible to me. If it's broad, so it will be... So the, uh, the thin bed will be uh, unseen, will be, uh, it will blind for me, I will not see it. Okay, there is a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, conditions, not all, also not related for the, the, the experiment, but also related to the environment you are working in. As an example, one, one time I was working in a, in a, in a cement factory for, for seismic experiment, 
and uh, there is trucks moving. So I, I cannot use explosive dynamite. It's it's uh, th there is uh, facilities there. So if I'm using dynamite, I will blow up blow up the the factory and go to jail. <laughs> so you you choose the source for the sake of your uh, experiment and also that suits the environment you are working in. This example show why we need to have narrow or finite width with it. Okay? So uh, as as you, you may remember from the Fourier series and Fourier transform era. Okay, you remember? If I'm using okay, we're speaking geology, so Paleozoic during our talk about Fourier series, if the, we have pulse, uh, we will have white, nearly white spectrum. And this white spectrum increase the resolution so that here, here we have thin bit and here is the source wavelet. So if I'm adding this as a reflection coefficient plus the source wavelet, you see, I can differentiate between, I can delineate the thin, the thin bed. And this also is a Fourier transform of the convolved. This, you can see this is a convolution. And you see also the thickness is also uh, present. So when the wavelet itself is more narrow, or more finite depths, or imitating the delta function, I am having good source. And this is present for the case of dynamite. So we have many type of sources. Uh, we have here the dynamite, air shooting, land air gun, vibrator, or Vibro size, Suzy, and uh, this one could be here. Uh, it's uh, weight, drop, and hammer. For the dynamite, you see, I cannot, uh, in general practice, we, we do not put the, the, the charge on the surface. We, we drill a hole for some depths and we, we put the charge and then we detonate. Why we do, we do this? Somebody have or has, sorry, has imagination can tell us why. Why we, we put the charge, the dynamic charge in a, in a borehole. Uh, Okay, let, let me uh, point, and the one I, I point, he can answer. Okay, uh, say. Yes. And uh, the surface, the energy will, will also, the, the, the energy is the same. Excuse me? It will penetrate deep. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for deep penet penetration. So uh, it's better to use it to, to detonate at the surface. <coughs> so why? Which means, what, what do you mean by effectiveness? It's important, but what do you mean by effectiveness? Because on the uh, surface, it will trigger the, only the surface width. And is, so the, the source is, the, the energy is losing to the, the atmosphere as well. Oh, this. Good. Excellent. Yes, 
Uh, because part of the energy will go up into the, into the air. But when I put the, the, the charge in a, in a borehole, the energy, all energy, will move into the ground. Okay? But it, it's, it's not going to, to produce surface wave only. It will produce surface wave and good waves. It's, okay? So the most common type of explosive impulsive source is a subterranean explosive source, which is a dynamite. Typically, an explosive source is used in, in, the volume, in the following manner. A hole, usually between 6 and 30 meters, drilled at the desired location. The charge is placed in the, bore, in the hole with a loading wool. It's an apparatus to put the charge at certain, at the desired location. Uh, and the charge is detonated with an electrically ignited blasting cap. The frequency of waves from small charge is higher than that of larger charges, and the depths of the charge affect noise generation. Standard charges expend their energy in all directions. A special type of explosive charge is used when a focused charge direction is desired. Okay, so I am putting the charge in a hole ranging from 6 to 30 meters. Uh, we have the energy spread in all directions. This is a key point. The small charges have high frequency than the uh, larger one. And also we can uh, use some type of charge that uh, produce directional. If I'm, I want the, 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 the detonation to be in depth direction only, then there is some type of charge that can be used for this object, objectives. So this is a movie, should be working, but yes. Uh, this movie is a small one to show the, the detonation. Of course, they, they put some, some dirt and some mud uh, on top of the uh, of the charge, and this all this uh, debris goes uh, like what like what you have seen now. The problem with with dynamite is that I cannot use in dwelling area in urban areas. I'm not supposed to go, for example, for Georgetown. I'm going to to carry out a seismic experiment, then I open sink and put my explosive in, and then detonate. It's, it's not uh, acceptable. Or is it acceptable? It's not acceptable. So I cannot use in urban areas. Dynamite can cause damages and require high security measures in some places. Like, like in, in, in Egypt, for example, you cannot have dynamite. Dynamite is owned only by the, ar by the army. And if you, are, you want to, for, for quarrying, must be an officer from the ar army with you to uh, use dynamite. It's not allowed for any, anyone. So it's restricted and it's security uh, complex for some countries like, like mine. Of course, I, I think many, many, many countries uh, follow this regulation because if dynamite is, is available, we will have uh, a lot of problem. Uh, dynamite must be fired away from water area or porous lithology because uh, the, the, the energy will be uh, lost in, 
uh, or absorb it in the, in the water or in the porous region. Another impulsive uh, source is the air shooting. Uh, air shooting, uh, in air shooting we have explosive charges used in air uh, shooting, but not like one in, in the hole, but we have an apparatus. And this apparatus is a number of sticks. This sticks, the charge is in chamber in above. And then, like, like the bullet, you know how the bullet work you know you didn't shoot some some time yes the bullet there is um, uh, some explosive in the in the bullet itself the 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 the, the part that is go away or for or hit uh, people or hit objects uh, is capping the, the storage of these explosives, and in the in the rear there is a cap capsule. When the the hammer, the the gun hammer, hit the cap, it ignites, and then huge amount of air suddenly uh, released, which push the shooting boy part. Uh, outside the, the gun. Okay? This is the same, nearly the same. We have chamber and this detonation, and then the sticks hit, go down and hit the, the ground. We have also another impulsive uh, source. This uh, impulsive source is called land air gun. This device consists of water pan with an expandable diaphragm and air gun. And, uh, and an air gun. This device is placed beneath a vehicle, lorry for example, and is held against the ground by the vehicle weight. So the vehicle weight is uh, pushing or pressing the air gun into the ground. The gun fires compressed air into the water band, forcing the band's diaphragm into the ground, creating an impulse which is transmitted into the air. So this is the illustration of this, and we have the pistol here, and when it's, it's like hydraulic gun. So uh, when the, the pressure pressed air is released, the diaphragm is moved down and hit the ground. No, no. The the vibe process is another another kind of apparatus. This one is the vibrosizer or vibrator. Uh, the land air gun is one impulsive hit, but the fiber size is not. It's non-impulsive. For fiber size or vibrator, the most common type of non-impulsive source, a vibrator composed of base plate connected to a piston inside large mass. Oil is either bumped in or out. You know the, the internal combustion uh, engine? It's something like the internal combustion, combustion engine, motor. So, the oscillations are trans transmitted through the plate into the ground. So, the vibrosides work in something like... So, we, we start by a small or a lo longer period and then shorter period or from low frequency to high frequency. But this source, this scheme must be known well because we are going to, in seismic data processing, to remove the effect of, the, of source using deconvolution or so to obtain the corrected 
uh, seismic section. Without this, we, we cannot see anything because we have multiple sources in this case. Okay, the oscillations are transmitted through the plate and to the ground. The vibrators are generally mounted on large trucks which move together over the prescribed area. Vibrators are useful in cities and other easily damaged area due to their low energy density. So sometimes I can use uh, vibro size, sometimes, not all, not always, in, in urban areas. Because also the, the trucks are, are heavy and in some places it's not allowed to pass. Some other uh, source called SUSI or uh, WACKER, it's the, it's the same like uh, fibrosis, but it's uh, giving um, uh, impulse, uh, sorry, it hits the ground uh, five or ten times per second for a limited, uh, for three uh, minutes, and the results is rec are recorded on detectors. The fibrosis and uh, the SUSI or the WACKER uh, are non-impulsive uh, sources, can be used in urban uh, areas, but requires an, uh, processing to remove the effect of longer uh, and multiple uh, source. Finally, we end up with weight drop and hammer. Weight, drop, weight droppers also generate impulses. So it's, it relates, it is part of the impulsive source family. The operation of a weight dropper consists simply of a dropping of three ton weight from three meter heights and recording the impulses. The impulses generated is not particularly strong and weight droppers are generally only good in deserts where the waterless conditions are best suited for this technique. Thank you. We finished our discussion. Our meeting was land survey. We finished the sources. And tomorrow we are continue. Inshallah, we are going to continue the subject.